Hi, everyone. Um, today, we are very happy to have uh, Pascal Poupa, who is a professor in the David Cheriton School of Computer Science um, at the University of Waterloo. Um, and so thank you very much, uh, Pascal, for accepting the invitation to, to present your work. And so um, well, today, Pascal is going to talk about uh, extending midfield error to uh, well, in several directions, uh, partial observation, multiple paths, and decentralized learning. So um, thank you very much. And um, the floor is yours. OK, thank you. Yeah, so uh, again, as I was mentioning just before, uh, so the work that I'll be presenting was uh, pretty much all done by Shuran Subramanian. So it's a bright uh, PhD student here at the University of Waterloo. In fact, he'll be graduating soon. So if you guys like uh, this work, then uh, uh, he's uh, uh, looking for jobs. And uh, But if you don't like the work, then I guess you can blame me, <laughs> OK? <laughs> all right, so let's go to the next slide. Okay, why isn't it working? Okay, there we go. Um, okay, so just a little bit of background about uh, my research and uh, the work that I do in general. Uh, so today, I guess my work spans deep learning, reinforcement learning, natural language processing, and also material design. Uh, historically, most of my work has been in reinforcement learning. And then at the moment, uh, some of the topics that my group are, are looking into include object level reinforcement learning, Bayesian reinforcement learning, constrained inverse reinforcement learning, multi-agent reinforcement learning, and also sport analytics. Now, I'd love to talk about all of this, uh, but we'll stick to just multi-agent reinforcement learning. So in fact, we'll talk about uh, mean field uh, reinforcement learning, which is, I guess, also the, the topic for, for this uh, seminar series. But if anybody's interested in any of the other topics, I'll be happy to uh, chat about those uh, at a separate time. Okay. Um, all right. So if we look at multi-agent reinforcement learning, one of the biggest challenge is simply to scale, uh, because in general, we suffer from this exponential complexity with respect to the number of agents. And, and then so there's been lots of work uh, trying to tackle this. There is one uh, direction, which is to consider uh, mean field theory, which has led to uh, a whole branch of, of mean field reinforcement learning where uh, the idea is that we have many agents and then we essentially abstract them into two agents. And this tends to be reasonable and attractive whenever we've got uh, application domains where essentially these many agents, you can think of them as really being part of a market. And there it makes sense to essentially uh, extract statistics like the mean field that we'll talk about in a moment uh, with respect to, to the market. And in fact, uh, this line of work, how, how I guess I, I got to work on this was um, in the context of uh, some research at Royal Bank of Canada, where uh, Shri Ram, uh, myself, uh, Matt Taylor, as well as Nidhi were all part of at, at the beginning. And, and there, um, I guess when you consider electronic trading, um, there are many agents. Uh, they are part of a market, they compete, and obviously we're not going to be able to scale if we're going to have every agent try to model every uh, other agent, but what is common is to essentially extract some statistics uh, about the, the market, about the whole population, and, and that's where uh, mean field reinforcement learning becomes attractive. Now, unfortunately, I won't have uh, experiments or results in the context of electronic trading. Um, so I, well, um, we're not anymore at Pro Bank of Canada. And, and then there's also, um, I guess, a gap between theory and practice. Uh, so, so I guess today the research has continued in the university setting. Um, and, and then I'll, I'll talk about some other applications uh, based on, on different test beds. And in fact, um, one application is in the context of ride sharing. Okay, um, now if we look a bit at the history of, of mean field reinforcement learning. Uh, so the idea of abstracting lots of agents, infinitely many agents into perhaps two agents. So our current agent and then um, a virtual uh, mean of the other agents uh, has been around for quite some time. So the word formalism, formal, uh, 
yeah, there was some formalism done uh, back in 2003 and 2007 by Huang et al, as well as Lastry and Leons. And, and here the, the idea is that if we cannot model individually all the other agents, very often it might be sufficient to, to simply look at the distribution of, of these other agents. And here, if we make a few assumptions, like for instance, if the agents are independent and also identical uh, and also uh, fully observable, then um, we can often uh, obtain some techniques that will work directly with a distribution of the other agents and, and then obtain um, some, some results that scale. Now in, in this work, I'm gonna talk about three papers essentially that we published over the past years, where we extended uh, some of the previous work in the context of mean field games. But um, here it's, it, these are extensions to make the work more practical, uh, to relax some of, of the assumptions. And, and so the first one will be to relax the uh, assumption that all agents are of a single type, in other words, homogeneous. So we're going to allow multiple types. Uh, we're also going to relax the assumption that all agents can observe essentially the mean field or the actions of all the other agents. So we're gonna allow partial observability. And finally, we're going to allow learning in a decentralized fashion. Um, so some of the previous work was assuming that um, essentially all the other agents being homogeneous, being of the same type, would learn an identical policy and, and then take advantage of that. But in reality, if we're in a non-cooperative setting, then you cannot assume that. And, and in practice, I mean, the agents are really going to learn uh, their own policy. Um, and and there's, there's some subtleties about that and, and we'll see how we can deal with this. So that's the menu for, for the talk. And in fact, if anybody's got a question as I go on, feel free to interrupt me and, and then I'll, I'll answer the question. Okay, so um, just as a quick um, background, um, when we talk about multi-agent reinforcement learning, what is common is to consider the notion of a stochastic game. So we'll have a, a certain number of agents, they'll have a shared state space, each agent will have some action space, and then what makes uh, multi-agent reinforcement learning challenging is the fact that now we need to model each agent individually. Uh, so if we've got n agents, then we're gonna have to look at these n actions and then perhaps uh, parameterize our reward function and the transition function based on the actions of all those agents. And now if there's a combinatorial uh, nature to the reward function with respect to those agents, then this function could be exponential with respect to the number of agents and, and same thing for the transition function. But at least in the worst case, that's, that's what we're facing, but uh, otherwise it's a very general formalism and, and it's a common one that is used in, in the community. Um, now, today we're gonna talk about uh, mean field games, which is um, uh, an abstraction of that with certain assumptions. So first, we're going to assume that the number of agents is in fact very large, close to infinite. And that might seem a little bit counterintuitive because often when people talk about scaling the number of agents, it's like, okay, let's just start with having you know, a few more agents, but we'll see that um, if we here go to the limit of an infinite number of agents, a lot of things can actually simplify. And, and this will be one of the hallmarks of, of mean field games. Um, so yeah, in fact, once you have a lot of agents, infinitely many of them, then we don't need necessarily to distinguish each one of them. So uh, there's an argument that each agent might have just an infin infinitesimal impact on uh, what happens in, in the environment. And therefore we could abstract out uh, all of these agents by just considering uh, their distribution. Uh, so I'm gonna denote this here by A bar. Um, so this is also known as, as the mean field. And so distribution of all the actions of all the agents. Um, and then uh, with that in place, um, with suitable assumptions, it might be the case that the reward function really just depends on this distribution and same thing for, for the transition. So whenever that's the case, then 
that leads to an, a notion of, of mean field gains. And, and yeah, so here, I guess mean field gains are not as general as stochastic gains, but computationally, they're going to be uh, a lot more tractable. We'll see that in a moment. And, and that, uh, I, I guess, even if the assumptions don't hold often, we can use uh, the mean field formalism as a way to approximate stochastic gains, or at least to obtain algorithms that are gonna be tractable. Okay. Um, now, just to be precise, when we talk about the distribution over actions, if we have discrete actions, um, then we can always represent the distribution as an average of uh, one hot representations of those discrete actions. So for instance, if we've got an agent that plays action, uh, action two, another agent that plays action one, another agent that plays action four, another agent that plays action two, we take the average of those one hot vectors, we get the following distribution, and this is the distribution of, of actions being played by, by those four agents, right? So, so here, I guess uh, the, the expression mean field is a bit of a misnomer. So it's actually misleading for people when they start reading about this the, the first time, because um, you think that it's going to be the mean action, and, and literally, it is here taking the mean of the actions of, of all the agents, but um, when you take really the, the mean of their one hot vector representation, you end up with a distribution. So I guess here, it's not so much the mean of the actions, but more the distribution of the actions. And, and this is the case as well for continuous actions. So here, instead of having a one hot vector representation, we'll just have a, a direct delta. Uh, for, for the action of, of each agent. And we can think of the mean field as really just being this mixture distribution, which in a limit becomes a probability density function. So, so that's what it, it, it could look like, okay? So I, at the end of the day, I guess that even though the name is mean field, let's always think of this as a distribution. And from that perspective, it's a lot richer than just taking the average because the average would just be one statistic of the distribution, but here we're actually keeping track of the entire distribution. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, so let's continue. Um, now, um, yeah, there's been lots of work on mean field games and also using the notion of mean field games to uh, yield approximate algorithms in multi-agent reinforcement learning. In particular, there was an influential algorithm proposed in 2018 by Yang et al. Uh, called just mean field reinforcement learning. And what they did is uh, they did not say, let's uh, consider mean field games per se, but they said, okay, we've got multi-agent, um, a multi-agent system. It's a stochastic game. And now let's see uh, what assumptions are needed to uh, use essentially tractable algorithms from mean field games to approximate what would be the, um, uh, the solution concept, uh, usually a Nash equilibrium that would be obtained in the context of, of stochastic games. And, and then, okay, so the, the assumptions that are typically needed are that uh, you have independent and identical agents. So that means they're gonna be of a single type. Uh, the agents are fully observable. Uh, they do centralized learning. And then also uh, in this particular work, so Yang et al. assumed that the Q function is additively decomposable and well approximated by the mean field uh, Q function. Uh, so concretely, so we've got here, you see the, the Q function of a multi-agent system where it depends on all the actions. And, and then if we assume that this can be decomposed into a sum of Q functions, uh, with respect to pairs of agents, then um, Yang et al. showed that this can be well approximated as we increase the number of agents by the mean field Q function. So this is pretty neat. And then they had a proof of convergence to an Nash equilibrium in, in the limit. Okay, now in, in our first piece of work, what we tackled is how to relax uh, the first assumption that agents are independent and identical. So in other words, instead of having just a single type, we're gonna consider multiple types of, of agents. 
Um, so, so that would occur naturally if you have teams of agents or if you have, let's say, predators and preys. Um, so so in, in most environments, it will be more than, than one type. And what I mean by a type, a type would be, I guess, uh, agents that have the same uh, reward function and I guess uh, action space and uh, characteristics in, in general. So, so if they're of the same type, that means they've got the same features and um, it would be natural that then they would also uh, learn similar policies, if not the, the, the same policies. Okay, so um, now we relax this to having M types. So uh, the natural thing to do is then to say, well, let's extend um, our notion of mean field games so that whenever we talk about the mean field, it will be the mean field of every subset of agent that correspond to a different type. So if I've got M types here, so I'm going to have a mean field action for type one, type two, up to type M, I can have in this way, my reward function depend on that. And, and then it is, it is more general, but obviously this will uh, lead to a cost in, in terms of uh, the computational complexity. But most of the time you see the number of types is not that large, at least compared to the number of agents. So, so we can still afford that. Um, and then in our work, we, we prove that we prove a theorem similar to what Yang et al. did originally, um, where we can approximate well the Q function of a stochastic game with the Q function for multi-type mean fields, uh, as long as it can be decomposed uh, with respect to um, groups of agents of, of different types. Okay, so I'm not going to go into the details of, of this theorem, but I guess I'm, I'm just stating that uh, we, we, we can show that. Uh, with uh, those assumptions. Okay, so now concretely, um, the mean field reinforcement learning algorithm that Yang et al. Uh, designed in 2018 uh, was based on the following equations. And what we did is essentially generalize those equations to have multiple types. So like you see here on, on the left-hand side, I'm using a bar to indicate the mean field of the single type of all the agents in the environment. And, and now you see, instead of just having a bar appear once, now we have a bar that appears m times for the m types. And, and then the, the Q function generalizes naturally in this way. Uh, same thing for, for, for the value function. Uh, whenever we compute our mean field or our mean value, uh, it's, it's the same idea. We, we can generalize that. And finally, we can have a Boltzmann policy uh, that also will depend on, on, on the mean field of, of all those types. Uh, so this generalizes in, in, in the obvious ways. Okay, any, any questions at this point? Uh, I have one quick question, if you don't yeah. mind. Uh, okay. So here in the, in the column on, uh, on the right for multi-type, um, mm -hmm. is there a different value function for every type or is it is it the same value function but taking a different inputs um so right so i guess uh here we have a value function for each agent j oh i see uh, naturally these agents that are of the same type will likely get the same value function um but at, at least the way it's modeled right now is that every agent computes a, a separate value function. So, so yeah, so here I, I forgot see. to mention that throughout the, the talk, I'll use the index J to indicate agents. So whenever you see like QJ, VJ, AJ, these are all things that are with respect to agent J. Oh, okay, I see, I see. So at this point, you don't necessarily consider one representative agent per population. You really keep your N or the number of agents and potentially they are going to learn the same value function because they, are, they have the same dynamics and same, I mean, yeah. in each population. Okay, thank you very much. Well, okay, so I, I guess with respect to this, um, what often happens is that when you expect these agents to converge to the same policy, same value function and so on. Uh, so in the literature, what would be common to do is to sort of like pool the, the learning in a way where, yes, they would learn a representative value function and a representative policy. And that can speed up the learning tremendously, reduce uh, the cost and, 
and, and that's perfectly suitable in cooperative environment. Here, I, I guess we wrote things in a way that's uh, more general, so, so that doesn't assume this here, uh, but that would be something that is frequently done, especially in cooperative environments. Uh, I see, thank you. I think there is another question in the chat about, um, so someone is confused about the point of representing bar A as one hot. Um, yeah, so may, maybe I can just clarify. So you, you you seem to emphasize that that it was important, or um, yeah, I guess so. So this kind of impression. So mean field, as from my impressions, is 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 exactly the equation that you have here. This like empirical, it's 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 like a system average over mm -hmm. agents. Um, but then you 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 mentioned that it was important to sort of think about it more as as this as a distribution and that's something like i always thought of it as an expectation of the distribution and in that sense it's a mean field like there's a field which is the distribution over agents in this case and uh and then the mean field is is the expectation and you're tracking the expectation and you can solve things over the expectation whereas you you could also consist of sort of more general um sort of uh, uh, mean field like approaches where you not only solve things with respect to the the expectation but also maybe you know higher order statistics of of the distribution yeah yeah so th th this is a very good point and that's why I'm, i emphasize this here so uh when, when we did the work over the years we had lots of discussions because it's very confusing when when we read different papers will emphasize or not emphasize this point, but most papers, when they talk about the mean field, they actually talk about the distribution. And, and then it's basically that they implicitly assume that for discrete actions, you would have uh, a, a one hot representation so that when you take the mean, you really end up computing the distribution. And, and, then, and then, yeah, you have access then to the full statistics uh, so it is, it is a lot richer in that sense than just taking the average of, of the, the actions. Uh, because with, with discrete actions, if you think about it, what, what could be otherwise the average of discrete actions? If we have categorical actions, like the action, uh, you know, uh, let's say uh, red versus blue versus yellow, right? What's, what's the average of that, right? Um, in, in, for categorical actions, it doesn't make sense to take an average unless you have a one hot representation. I think that's one way to, to do it, right? Okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, I also have one question. Uh, in the table that you're uh, displaying, um, so it's S is the entire state uh, of the game, not just the individual agent, right? S. Yeah, so okay, and in those equations that we have here, I am assuming that S is a shared state um, that corresponds to the entire game indeed. Um, so, uh, the, so the, then it gets to the notion of shared state. Is it the intersection of like you know, something that is just shared. So each agent has another state as well, or it's just when you say shared, it means the entire column like, consisting each element being the state of each agent. Um, so yeah, so here it, it, it could be both, but in, in general, I, I guess, yeah, here would be Anything from a Marco, Markovian perspective that is needed, you know, for, 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 for the game to remain Markovian. So, so I guess a, it'll be often uh, some information that's shared. Like, let's say, let's say we've got a maze. So the maze itself, uh, the configuration of the maze. So, so that's not something that's per agent, right? So this is something that, that's global. But then it would also be the location of every agent in, in, in the maze. Okay, so so at this point, this is the assumption that we're making, but we're going to relax that in a moment when we talk about partial observability. Um, so my uh, actually a follow-up question is that, like, you know, in the mean field uh, games literature, we see that we have a mean field 
of state where here you have a mean field of actions and that's okay. the part that i'm you know uh, a bit confuses me if you can clarify i appreciate okay yeah yeah you're right that uh, in, in the literature there's some papers talk about mean field of action some papers talk about mean field of states and some paper talks about mean field of state action pairs so uh, here i only talk about the mean field of actions um and 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 in fact um it, it could apply as well to uh environments where it, it would be more mean field of states that that would matter so so we could we could rewrite all those equations in, in that respect but at least for now uh and the experiments that we've done um it was more about uh, mean field of actions but from a theory perspective there's nothing special about that so it could have been mean field of states or mean field of state action pairs all right thanks okay all right, so let's continue. Um, okay, so yeah, I guess, uh, yeah, here I, I, I showed the equations, how we generalize them to multiple types. And um, in terms of approximating um, the Q function and yeah, in terms of approximating the, the Q function that could be obtained if we were able to like model all agents individually, um, we derive the following bound where whenever we uh, estimate a mean field and then we compare that to the individual agent actions, um, if this mean field uh, is not too far from the agent action, so uh, in other words, if the agents of the same type tend to all execute roughly the same actions and therefore they're close to, to their average, um, then um, we'll have um, uh, here, I, I guess, yeah, here we can derive a, a bound on, on this difference that, that's epsilon, and then we can show that the Q function will depend on this epsilon as well. So it depends on epsilon as well as L, where L is um, uh, a, a bound on, on the smoothness of, of the Q function. Okay, so, so we derive this, uh, this theorem uh, that show that essentially by increasing the number of types uh, that allows us to better uh, represent uh, subgroups of agents, uh, because if those agents are really homogeneous and tend to execute similar actions, then their, uh, their mean field will be close to, to their actions and then we'll get a better approximation. Um, and, and as a result, uh, this bound will, will get tighter. Um, so that, that was one of the contributions from, from a theory perspective. Okay, uh, now in practice, uh, an interesting question then is, okay, let's, uh, how do we implement such an algorithm? And, and what about the types? Do we assume that the types are known or unknown? And, and so first we, we have an algorithm here that assumes that the types are known. So if we already know which agent belongs to which type, and, and then um, we can essentially um, derive a Q-learning algorithm that uh, is based on, on those four equations here. Um, and here, this is just a flow diagram of, of this uh, Q-learning algorithm. But now we can generalize that as well to unknown types where the, uh, the flow diagram changes a little bit where we need to introduce a step where we would uh, learn what are the types of each agent over time? And, and here we did something very simple where we simply use k-means uh, to cluster agents. And, and essentially um, each agent the cluster it belongs to will correspond to its type. And this is something dynamic as the agents learn and execute actions, then they observe the other agents as well they uh, change what their estimates are of those clusters by key means. And, and eventually, you know, this will settle down and, and then this, these will be the, the types in, in, in the long run. Um, and, and this gives us a way to also learn the types. Um, so then we, we applied this to some benchmarks. Um, the first was a multi-team battle um, where we had a, an initial stage where we're training 
um, with the same algorithm for 2000 episodes. And then after that, we do a face off against other algorithms. So basically, we, we took several algorithms from the literature as well as our algorithm. So these algorithms include um, MFQ, so that's um, mean field Q learning uh, that was proposed um, based on, on the framework of uh, mean field reinforced learning uh, that I described earlier. There's also mean field actor critique, independent learning, and then our multi-type mean field Q learning. So, so those three algorithms here, they either assume a single type. Uh, so I guess, yeah, MFQ, MFAC, they assume a single type. And IL, which is independent learning, um, does not even use any notion of mean field. It, it just, it just uh, learns by assuming that uh, the environment uh, does not contain agents per se, but you know, all the agents are really folded into the environment that's uh, uh, assumed to be stationary. And it, it just learns in, in, in the simplest way like that. Okay, so, so we just compare to, to these uh, three algorithms. And, and then so in stage one, each algorithm just learns uh, to play against itself um, uh, for 2000 episodes. And then after that, we deploy them uh, in stage two against the other algorithms. And here we report uh, the results for that. So, uh, so we can see during training, how much reward they learn when they play against themselves. And then at test time, so in stage two, uh, how much reward they earn uh, when they play against other agents. And then so our agent here uh, that uses a mean field and in fact, uh, multiple types um, wins uh, because it can better approximate uh, the Q function correctly. Um, simply because it, it does take into account the multiple types, whereas the other regions do not, okay? Um, and then, yeah, an another set of experiments with predators and prey. Uh, so similar type results. Um, we can see again that our agent performs better. And, and then, yeah, we've got the rewards here. This is the win rate, so how, what percentage of games does uh, each team win in, in this fashion? Okay, any questions regarding this? Yeah, I, actually, I, I can't see the chat. So if there are questions in the chat, please uh, let me know. <laughs> uh, and people should feel free to turn on their microphone as well. Oh, I think there is no question for now in the chat. So. Okay, okay, good. Thank you. All right, so, so this is the first part of the talk where we talked about um, multiple types. Uh, now let's go to partial observability. And uh, this will be the, the second part and then we'll have later decentralized learning, the, the third part. Okay, so for partial observability, so, so now this will address an, an earlier question of, you know, uh, are we really assuming that the state uh, contains uh, everything and is observable by everyone? Uh, and, and now we're going to allow uh, states to be partially observable. And, and in fact, we'll also allow the mean field to be partially observable. So the mean field, um, either it's uh, like either each agent would construct it by observing the actions of all the other agents or the states of all the other agents and, and then construct that distribution, or there would be some some central um, party, central entity that would do this aggregation and make that available. So like in electronic markets, uh, typically there would be, um, uh, I guess, uh, some, some central entity that, that uh, you know, runs the market and then would display information about uh, the, the, the market and, and, and therefore would, would essentially provide what, what is the mean field. Uh, but otherwise, you have to assume that um, each agent can observe everything. So, so yeah, so here we're going to relax that. So essentially now it's going to become partially observable. And in terms of partial observability, we can look at uh, different types of partial observability. So depending on what is the domain, sometimes it makes sense to say that the partial observability has to do with um, maybe a fixed radius that, okay, uh, your agent is in the world and then it can observe things around itself up to a certain distance. And, and then so everything within that radius, it observes it. 
beyond that, it doesn't. Uh, so this is kind of like, you know, um, uh, a hard uh, constraint of what it can observe. And then you can also have something that's more probabilistic where every agent can in fact see uh, everything everywhere, but with a different degree of accuracy depending on the distance. So, so here, uh, this probabilistic distance-based observability would mean that um, you, like let's say you're on the street, you see people, well, you can recognize somebody you know if this person is nearby, this person is like 100 meters away, uh, you may not be able to fully recognize the person. So, so you see the distance can impact your ability to recognize uh, what, what you see around. So, so this gets captured here where the probability of recognizing something or seeing something depends on, on the distance. So like I said, these are the two types of partial observability that we consider in, in this uh, second part of the work. Uh, just to illustrate, so when we look at mean field Q learning, uh, intuitively, the idea is that we've got our agent, which is in green here. Uh, this would be the space of all the other agents. And, and normally, it would, we would assume that they can observe er everything. So everyone can observe everyone. Uh, whereas with um, the fixed observation radius, the idea is that each agent can only observe the nearby agents up to a certain radius. And then with um, uh, the prosthetic distance observation, then uh, they might observe some agents in some directions based on the distance better than, than others. So that would be the, 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 the picture. Uh, now to deal with partial observability, since we cannot observe the mean field directly or otherwise constructed based on observing everyone, uh, what we did is, okay, we assume that we receive some observations and then we construct a belief about the mean field because we don't know really what's the, the exact mean field. And then in terms of belief, um, we, we use a distribution. Um, a natural way of doing this could be to consider a, a Dirichlet distribution or otherwise to also consider a, a gamma distribution. So the Dirichlet distribution is a distribution over um, discrete distributions. Uh, so like if we've got discrete actions and we want to have a distribution over discrete distribution, then the Dirichlet uh, is, is a natural one. So we use that. And then for the distance-based uh, case, where we have observations that perhaps are not necessarily discrete, but they depend on, on, on the distance, then the, the gamma distribution is a nice one that um, essentially has a probability that, that decreases with the distance and, and, and lends itself well for, for that. So these are two types of uh, uh, prior distribution. And then we took a Bayesian approach where you have either a Dirichlet or a gamma as a prior, you make some observation, you update those Dirichlet or otherwise a gamma distribution to obtain a posterior. And, and, and that's what's used instead of the actual mean field. Okay, so there's some mathematical details for this, but at a high level, that's, that's the idea. Um, okay, so in fact, yeah, so here I show some of the details for, for the gamma distribution, uh, but let's not worry too much about that. Uh, the key is that at the end of the day, you see I'm using here A tilde to indicate that I've got an approximation of the mean field that comes from the belief of the agent as opposed to A bar, which was the exact mean field. Okay. Um, yeah, and, and then the policy is also going to depend on this estimated mean field. Um, and then in the case of um, the gamma distribution, we'll, we'll have different hyperparameters. Uh, so there's a lambda that we introduce for, for the distance as well that, that's important. Uh, so this, this could uh, be adjusted depending on what type of distribution we use. Uh, but that's, um, that's what it would look like, okay? Um, and then um, we have a flow chart again for the algorithm, but essentially it is following the same equations that we saw before. They're just adjusted for the fact that now we estimate the mean field uh, in a Bayesian way instead of observing it directly. And um, depending on what is our belief, uh, the, the type of distribution that we use, we might have... Uh, uh, different computation needed. Uh, so, so here 
these two different flow diagrams, they, 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 they show those, those differences. Okay, and, and finally, we, we did some experiments to illustrate uh, if agents are really just given partial observability, uh, how well will, will they do if we have um, our agent that is a partial observable mean field Q learner versus other agents that are either using mean field or not. But then in their case, what they observe, they just treat it as the mean field, even though it's in fact incorrect. And, and then they're not really updating it in, in a Bayesian way. So they're just, they're just assuming that what they observe is in fact the mean field, even though it's, it's incorrect. And then in our case, because we acknowledge the fact that what we observe is not the mean field, and then we do a Bayesian update, we get something that's more accurate. And as a result, um, our, our agent tends to perform better. Um, so, so yeah, so these curves are again for training. So you can see that our agent earns more reward. And then at test time, we do again a face-off where every agent plays against every other agent. Uh, so here on the x-axis, this is the performance of, of those different agents. And, and then this would be with respect to different adversaries. So for instance, uh, the blue bar here means that we've got our agent uh, that's playing against an independent learner. And then this shows for our agent, what's the number of games that it won out of a thousand, okay? And then if it plays against MFQ or MFAC, this would be the number of games. If it plays against itself, then at that point, it, it just wins you know, half of the game. So, so, so then that would be 500. Uh, so that gives you an idea. So our agent uh, wins more against the other agents in, in, in this scenario. Um, and then, okay, some, something similar now for the distance base, um, partial observability. So I'm not gonna go into the details, but it's, it's the same story. So any questions regarding this? Okay, so everyone... Pascal, I'd like to ask about what exactly is um, uh, observed and unobserved in your flow chart. Um, it had a box which said, um, here we are, execute action and observe R and S primed, um, which uh, uh, states are uh, observed under this scheme. Okay, so, so yeah, so here for observe S prime, so this would be, uh, a, a, I guess, a local state. I, I guess yeah, here we're, we're not being precise, but this S prime is, is a local state. So for instance, uh, an agent at a certain location, let's say that it has uh, this uh, fixed radius observability, then it would observe the location of the other agents that are within that radius. And then it just wouldn't observe any other agents beyond that, okay? Great, thanks. Okay. All right, so let me talk about the last part here. So uh, decentralized mean field games. So here we're going to um, relax all the assumptions that we discussed so far. So we won't have single type agents. Um, so agents will be heterogeneous. Um, we won't have fully observable agents. They, they will observe just their local states. And finally, uh, we won't assume that all agents are learning the same policy. So they're going to learn effectively, possibly different policies. Okay, so concretely, uh, now I'm going to use um, SJ to indicate clearly that agents are observing local states um, that are different possibly for each agent. Uh, they're going to estimate as well A field J, which will mean here an estimate or an approximation of the mean field that are based only on the local observations that each agent makes. So normally you see the mean field uh, should be the distribution of all the agents. Now it's going to be a distribution of, of the other agents, but only based on what each agent can observe. And therefore each agent will have its own estimate of the mean field. 
And then finally, each agent is also going to learn its, its own policy. So we're gonna have PyG to indicate that. Um, now, in the theory of mean field games, um, one important uh, concept is, is the mean field equilibrium. And typically, this would be denoted as follows. We would say that a policy pi star and a mean field a star is um, an equilibrium whenever this policy pi star earns the highest rewards compared to any other policy with respect to, to the current mean field. And then at the same time, the current mean field would be induced by all the agents playing this policy pi star. So, so I'm gonna argue that this notion of a mean field equilibrium is in fact a centralized mean field equilibrium because here we are really assuming that every, all the agents are going to have the same policy at the equilibrium. And then they're also going to have the same uh, mean field at the equilibrium. In reality, there is really just one mean field, but if you have partial observability, you may not be able to observe that, or at least your estimate might be different from other agents. Um, and, and then we'll want to, to relax that. But at, at, in any case, many papers in literature make those assumptions. And, and now we're, we're going to relax this by considering a decentralized mean field equilibrium. So now for a decentralized mean field equilibrium, we're going to allow each agent to have its own policy and its own estimate of the mean field at the equilibrium. And um, the meaning will be similar where the, the policy pi star of each agent should be the best one compared to other policies that the agent could consider uh, as a response to its estimate of the mean field. And then its estimate of the mean field is going to be based on all the other agents playing their policy of, of, uh, at, at the equilibrium, but also based on what the agent J can observe of those policies, okay? So, so this is a, a more realistic solution concept than what is traditionally assumed in, in mean field games, uh, because yeah, now, now we, we allow agents to really um, converge to, to different things. Any questions regarding this? If not, let's continue. <clears throat> so now we can revisit again the equations for mean field reinforcement learning. So we saw those equations earlier. So the, the Q function, the value function, the mean field, and, and then the, the Boltzmann policy. Uh, now, when we consider decentralized mean field reinforcement learning, um, one thing that we'll want to do is um, be quite general in terms of what um, each agent uh, does in terms of estimating the, the mean field. And here, I'm just gonna write a function f uh, that takes as input what is the previous estimate of, of the mean field and the current observable part of the state for agent j, and then update that to come up with an estimate at um, the current time step. And here, this function f um, in our work is just going to be a neural network. So this is something that the agent is going to learn uh, by supervised learning. Um, the idea is that at every time step, you see the agent can um, have its own estimate and then predict what the mean field should be uh, at the current time step based on the actions of the other agents that it hasn't observed yet. So normally, you see the mean field is the distribution of the actions of all the other agents. But when it selects an, a, when it, uh, selects an action, it needs to do that without yet knowing what the other agents are going to play. So we often have like this uh, chicken and egg problem. And, and here to resolve that, we uh, use a neural network. Um, I mean, it doesn't have to be a neural network, but essentially we use a predictor to uh, where the agent will learn to predict what the mean field should be uh, without necessarily observing what the other agents are, are, are doing. Um, yeah, so, so this chicken and egg problem that I was just mentioning, we can observe it 
in the original equations of mean field reinforcement learning because normally you see the mean field um, would depend on the policy of the other agents at the current time step. And then the policy of each agent would normally depend on the mean field as well at the current time step. But because we can't have this uh, dual dependence, right? Um, to break this, what is typically done is to have a policy that depends on the mean field at the previous time step, even though theoretically that's, that's wrong. In practice, we didn't really have a choice. And that's what Yang et al. did in 2018. And most papers after that did the same thing. So everyone was essentially just conditioning uh, this policy here on the previous mean field as opposed to the, the current mean field. But if instead we have a predictor that allows us to predict what we think is going to be the current mean field, then we can have the policy depend on that estimate. And at some level, you see, um, when we have partial observability as well, we know that we're not going to have uh, a perfect observation of the mean field anyway. So predicting it um, may not be that bad anyway, because we wouldn't be able to observe it anyway. So, so that's what we, uh, we end up doing here, OK? Um, yeah, so I guess the benefit is that with this neural net, then we resolve this chicken and egg problem. It also allows us to, to deal in, in a fairly general way about uh, partial observability. So you see, in the previous work, I explained, um, well, at a very high level, two approaches based on uh, Dirichlet distribution, gamma distribution for specific types of partial observability. But I mean, there's lots of other scenarios one could think of that would not fit those two types of partial observability. And here we're being fairly general by just saying, OK, you'll observe something, SJ. You'll need to use it in combination with um, your current estimate of the mean field to predict the next mean field. And, and then it's just going to be a prediction. Um, we could use Dirichlet, we could use um, gamma distribution, or we could use other things. At the end of the day, it's just going to be a prediction. And, and then we can simply train a neural net to, to, to do that. OK, so, so here we're, we're essentially leveraging neural net for the flexibility. OK, so in this work, um, Shuram also uh, spent quite a bit of time uh, illustrating the algorithm on a real world application. Um, so this was a uh, right pool matching. So that's uh, an important problem uh, for taxis, uh, whether it's uh, uh, taxis uh, like the New York yellow taxis or, or Uber. Um, so uh, a lot of the systems today, the way they operate is that uh, every taxi is like an agent. And, and then they receive requests, and then they have to indicate uh, when they would like to, uh, I guess, uh, take a, a possible request. And, and an important problem is how to make sure that uh, a lot of requests can be satisfied, ideally all the requests or as many requests as possible. And, and then in principle, I mean, this could be solved by centralizing everything but it's, uh, it would be intractable. You know, if you have uh, hundreds, if not thousands of taxi drivers, and, and then you, they, you, you cannot easily centralize all their decision-making and, and their information, uh, what is more practical is to have each taxi driver essentially run an agent that will decide when to bid for possible requests. And, and ideally, uh, this will converge to uh, some equilibrium where uh, as many requests will, will be satisfied. So, so here, Sharam took uh, data from this uh, New York uh, New York Yellow Taxi data set, uh, trained with eight days of data, and then tested with six days of data. And then we can see here the service rate is a percentage of requests uh, that got ful fulfilled. Now, you'll notice that this percentage uh, is, is quite low, like 30%. That seems to be a lot lower than when you go on the street and, and you hail a cab. Uh, usually, you know, somebody will come. Uh, it's not like 70% of the time nobody comes. 
there will be uh, a taxi that will come. And, and the reason why it's low is simply because for the purpose of the experiments, uh, he reduced the number of vehicles. So normally in New York City, there's a lot more than 120 taxis, okay? So he reduced the number of vehicles. So that actually makes it more challenging because if, if you really have just a small number of vehicles, then it becomes a lot more challenging to service as many requests as possible. And here we can see how different algorithms perform in terms of servicing uh, as many requests as possible. The algorithms that Shuram compared this to include a, a combinatorial optimization technique uh, that is not based on mean field games or reinforced learning or anything. It's just based on taking um, the problem uh, while well, formulating it as, as a, um, an optimization problem. And in fact, trying to take into account the fact that we've got many different agents and, and account for the combinatorial nature of the problem. Um, so, so then, um, yeah, that algorithm did not perform so well because it would only take into account as well the local information, but not the mean field um, with respect to the entire population of, of agents. Um, there's also a, a neural adaptive dynamic programming technique uh, that was uh, in the literature that, that he compared to, and same thing. So that one too was not uh, taking into account the mean field either, whereas our approach does, but at the same time, does not assume that agents are learning in a centralized fashion um, and, and also allows for partial observability. And then so we obtain the higher service rates, okay? So this is with respect to the number of vehicles. We can also put, um, uh, a constraint on the maximum time it would take for a pickup uh, to, to, to be done. Uh, so then if the, um, uh, this constraint is, is higher, then you can have a higher service rate. And, and that's what we observe here. Okay, so I, I guess yeah, these are results that show that our algorithm performed quite well, at least in comparison to uh, the state of the art uh, that, that was in the literature. Okay, any questions regarding this? Okay, so if not, then let me conclude. So I guess to summarize, um, so the work that we've embarked on was to essentially explore mean field reinforcement learning. And, and then when, over the years, when we uh, tried to use it in different applications, we realized that um, there were some assumptions that did not always hold. And then so I guess most of our work has been in terms of um, uh, relaxing those assumptions. So we saw how we can deal with multiple types, partial observability and decentralized learning. And in fact, for decentralized learning, you kind of need to also have already partial observability and it naturally allows for uh, multiple types or at least heterogeneous agents. So, so that's what we've done. And as was pointed out uh, uh, by someone during the talk, uh, everything that we've done so far, we've only looked at mean fields of actions, but uh, it would be natural to extend this to mean fields of state action pair. So this is the most general uh, notion of uh, uh, mean field that is out there in the literature and perhaps uh, should be used. Theoretically, I don't think that there's uh, much difference, but in practice, obviously, this will allow uh, more problems to be tackled. And then finally, uh, even though it's nice to be able to take into account uh, the full distribution uh, that corresponds to, to the mean field, as we discussed, uh, a distribution essentially has different statistics. And, and then for different problems, it may be sufficient to work with certain statistics and ignore the other statistics. Because uh, in fact, when we look at the mean field of, for a large number of agents, and let's say these are continuous states or continuous actions, we don't have uh, a simple way of representing the, the mean field. In the case of discrete states and discrete actions, you can take the average of the one hot vectors, you get a vector that's the dimensionality of number of states or number of actions. And if that's not too large, then your representation of the mean field is actually quite simple. But in the case of continuous states and actions, 
we don't have a simple way of representing the mean field. Ultimately, you know, it's, it's really a mixture of direct deltas and, and that would grow with the number of states in action. And you could say that then this defeats the purpose of the notion of, of mean field games where we're supposed to approximate that. So then there's a need to look for uh, actual statistics uh, from that, the distribution that we would want to, to leverage. And, and that's something that uh, Shuram is uh, currently working on. Okay, so yeah, let me stop here. I'll take uh, any additional questions and, and thank you very much. Thank you very much for the nice talk. Um, other questions? I see there is one raised hand, um, Thanos. Hi, uh, thank you for your very interesting talk. Uh, in fact, I have a question about the decentralized uh, learning. Mm -hmm. If you could go back to the slide uh, where you have the two columns. Yes, exactly. Uh, yes. So, okay, I have to, to declare that I'm not familiar with uh, mean free games of uh, action. Usually I am more familiar with states. So whatever I would, maybe I would say something stupid, but uh, just to understand. Uh, so when you have the, the alpha, like the, okay, okay, plus you didn't say, but I can assume that you work in a kind of stationary ergodic setting, uh, right? You, you work in a, an ergodic setting. Uh, <clears throat> is it ergodic? Because I, I, I guess- Okay, ergodic maybe it's not ergodic, but for sure it should be stationary. Well, I mean, here agents are learning, so I doubt that it's stationary mm -hmm. in the limit. Okay. At, Maybe at there's a limit is stationary. Yes. Maybe the question is about the, if the goal is to learn something that is stationary in the limit. Maybe. Oh, okay. Yes. 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 Okay. I see. Uh, well, uh, so yes. So this is this is the stationary part, but. I was going to ask, like, when you when you want to learn the the mean field uh, for the actions, like, if what is what is the um, uh, the dependence on what you feed the neural network? Because like, if you assume that you are already in something stationary, uh, okay, you approximate, and then it's kind of uh, easy. You 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 want to learn the distribution that is stationary, and this is this is it. But if you start from something that is bad, like that, you start from very far from. Uh, Equilibrium. Then, uh, how, do you have guarantees that you are going to converge in the in the good in the stationary distribution for this for the alpha for the mean field? Right. Okay. So, I, I guess with neural nets anything can happen. <laughs> so it may not uh, converge to something that uh, is necessarily uh, stable or or a fixed point. Uh, but okay, if uh, if things um, uh, work uh, well. Because uh, I, I guess with neural nets, the problem is we're doing non-convex optimization. They might get stuck into local optima. And as a result, we might not have a, a, an F that is a, a reasonable approximation here. Uh, but and yeah, if, if on the other hand, so I, I, I guess I yeah, hear if we want to really ensure that this will converge and will be stable and all that, I guess we'd have to impose some constraints on F. So, so that, um, uh, yeah, well, th th this is where normally if we're being Bayesian, um, then the nice thing about approximate Bayesian techniques is that when you do an approximation to your posterior distribution, you can sort of like treat it as a new prior and it doesn't matter what the prior is, you'll still converge in, in the limit. So, so, so then, Approximate Bayesian techniques typically tend to be um, uh, more stable or at least have some, some guarantees of converging to something. Uh, whereas with, with neural networks, you, you could get some, some divergence. Um, so that's something empirical. And, and but yeah, you, you're absolutely right here that, that this is something we should be concerned about. And one more question, like more kind of conceptual, uh, differing about uh, uh, centralized or decentralized, as you said, like in the decentralized or kind of, because this is my idea about mean field games in, in general, that they were constructed as decentralized because like, you have this assumption of uh, weak uh, 
dependence when, when you put the empirical mean in the costs or in the values, whatever, that you have the weak dependence that each, uh, like it has to depend weakly on each of the state, the, the cost or the value function has to depend weakly on each state. So then you can get the, the average and then this is why you need to, to use the focal plan to, to get the, the fixed point when you work in dynamical uh, thing. So when I kind of have a difficulty to understand the, the notion of decentralized here, because if you assume again that you depend weakly on its uh, action, uh, then uh, the, the population or the typical agent, the, the representative agent is going to, to, to act in a decentralized way. Like uh, there's not going to be a central planner that is going to, to tell everybody what to do. And this is this is why I can of have it difficult to understand the notion of decentralized. Okay, so I'm, I'm not sure I'm fully understanding your your question, but okay, generally speaking, uh, I agree that um, each agent by trying to estimate what the mean field is may learn to do some approximation or some estimation that is completely off. That that could happen. Um, and, and it could happen in part because it only observes part of the space and also because it, it has to do some, some approximation. So when I say it only observes part of the space, so like you see, when we talked earlier about like the fixed radius observation, you could imagine that let's say you've got uh, two teams of agents that are entering into a battle, uh, an agent that has a certain location and with other agents, and, and then they see uh, within their radius, so they just see you know, their own team. They don't see the enemy that's like on the other side of the map and because they're too far. And, and now they have, I guess, um, uh, a belief about what the mean field is that can be very far from the true mean field simply because they, they have no, no information about these other agents that are too far, that are completely unobservable, right? So, so this this could happen, um, but I mean that's reality, right? But like if I if I could give also an example to to elaborate more what I want to say is that if you take like the the very classical example of the flock, like uh, with cars in the flock, like you you are going to go around in some plastic wall and you want to. To, you are the driver, you want to play against the, the distribution of the cars that move around the, the roundabout. Uh, so if you are only looking at your closest neighbors, uh, in, in some sense, there is, there is almost no guarantee that you will arrive in a nice equilibrium overall. Like if everybody, everybody is just looking for the nearest neighbors, there is no guarantee that you will arrive because uh, you might think that uh, some, some areas are less congested, but then you arrive that, there and other people have thought the same. And so in, in some sense, this is kind of well, the thing that I don't understand. Um, but, but this is part of the definition of, if, if I may, uh, it, yes. I think it was part of the definition of the equilibrium, right? Like you change the definition of the equilibrium so that it incorporates the partial information maybe. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, so here, I'm, I'm not being completely formal, but, but you see, um, we have here a bar J star, that is the mean field observed by agent J when all other agents play pi J star, right? So, so here, we take into account only what agent J observes. So, so that could be very far from the true mean field. But then you see agent J will then um, select some actions based on, on, on that mean field that it believes, right? And, yes. and then ultimately, when all agents keep on choosing the same actions, right? And they're not updating their policies anymore. And then the mean field uh, that each one of them has computed doesn't change. Then we have an equilibrium. Um, and and that's, that's what I've defined here. But I, I agree that, I, I guess for this to happen though, um, there, there have to be some conditions. Okay, in, in the paper, we, we uh, make several assumptions that ensure that this will happen. But in reality, uh, some of those assumptions 
may not always hold because you could find yourself where agents are going to start cycling where you see one agent now updates its policy that causes another agent's mean field to, to change. Therefore, that other agent changes its policy. And then there could be some cycling effect where we won't have con convergence, right? We won't have an actual equilibrium. Uh, so, so these things are, are, are possible, right? Um, but, but yeah, in, in terms of just describing an equilibrium, these would be the conditions, but what I'm not saying here, I'm not saying that this will always be the case and limit that we're gonna arrive at an equilibrium. Uh, certain conditions have to hold for that. And, and in practice, I mean, this, this would be observed whenever there's some cyc cyclic behavior. Does that make sense? Mm, yes, thank you. Okay. <laughs> Okay, yeah. thanks. Uh, more questions? Uh, I don't know if you still have time, uh, but. Yeah, yeah, I've got time. Okay. Uh, I had one small question about this setting compared with the previous one. So here is a policy pi j uh, depends on j. And was this already, so I think in, in this decentralized setting, you clearly mentioned that each agent is going to learn a, a policy that is potentially different from um, from the other agents. But was this or was this not yet the case in the previous setting where you have partial observation and different agents have potentially different observations? In this case, they don't learn different policies already? Yes, okay, so yeah, so that's, um, uh, the, there's the theory and then there's the practice, okay? So this slide is about the theory because okay. most papers that talk about mean field gains will talk about the mean field equilibrium. And then they'll talk about this type of equilibrium, which assumes that uh, we have a, a centralized mean field equilibrium with a, a single policy for, for all agents. Now, despite the fact that most papers go with the theory that makes these assumptions, uh, what we've seen is that in fact already in the 2018 paper by Yang et al. So this is a paper that talks about an algorithm that's practical for mean field reinforcement learning. And then they already have, you see, the idea that every policy um, can be different. There's a pi j indicating that every policy can be different, right? So, so most papers, I guess they will talk about some theory, some practice, and there will be a difference be between the two, right? Okay. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah. And so here you clarify one notion of, of decentralized equilibrium somehow. So where exactly. you have a clearly the mathematical framework. Okay, thank you. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so I guess, yeah, part of our contribution in that work from the theory side is, is now to acknowledge the fact that we're gonna have a decentralized mean field equilibrium because really the, the centralized mean field equilibrium that most papers were talking about was, was clearly not matching what the algorithms would learn. Like the algorithms would actually learn possibly different policies. And, and now we acknowledge the fact that, okay, then if they're gonna learn different policies, then, then presumably if they converge to some equilibrium, then these pol in, in that equilibrium, the policies have to be possibly different, right? So, so that's what we, we, we've done here. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so if there are no more questions, um, thank you again for the very nice talk and for answering all the questions.